good morning, everyone. Uh, just to remind those that are going to have lunch with Hannah, uh, you meet her at 109 uh, at her office. It's 109 after the second class, okay? And remember, you have class during the afternoon again uh, with uh, Carlos. So yeah, you need to be back and let us know if something happened in the restaurant that you cannot come back. <laughs> A rain or something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, have a good class. So, um, yeah, I yesterday I promised to check some facts uh, for which I didn't have the answers um, yesterday. This is what scientists do. We uh, we actually had an interesting discussion uh, with one of you at the uh, coffee break afterwards about how to deal with the fact that you know, as a young student, you might not have the confidence because everybody who teaches you seems to know so much about everything. And I was trying to convince this student that, that actually, you know, I'm an expert on a very narrow peak of things that I know. And when I move a little bit outside that, then it's totally okay for me to say that, well, actually, I don't know. I, I don't know how exactly they do the salmon things. And, you know, there's other experts who do that. And, um, and I maybe use this opportunity to tell a story because this is sort of part of the mentoring aspects of, um, of this class that I think most people um, start their scientific careers feeling this kind of like insecurity feelings and uh, kind of like, oh my God, you know, I know nothing and there's so much to know. And there was a really big moment for me that actually made, in a good way, it made me more confident by seeing somebody else fail, it's kind of awful, but you know, <laughs> but, but, but the point of the story that this somebody else, I, I won't mention the name, it was somebody who is really, really, really famous. So I gave an, um, so he gave a talk and I was listening to that talk and the talk was fantastic and he was kind of like amazing. But then somebody asked a question um, and the question was on a topic that I know quite a lot about, but he, the speaker, did not know very much about it. And totally with confidence, he gave an answer that was complete bullshit. Um, and that made me kind of realize that everybody just appears so good because they are invited to give talks about that topic that they really, really, really know something about. And then when, you know, there's this kind of like a peak of knowledge that they stand on, and then when you ask them to comment on something that's a bit outside, you know, they can just completely crash. And I think that's why always also the big, you know, Nobel Prize winners, they find it amusing that, I mean, if they are intelligent and nice people, they find it amusing that afterwards people believe that they know everything about everything and they're asked to comment on whatever, uh, when in reality, of course, you know, they, they have the same peak structure as, as anybody else. But at the same time, what's really nice about being a scientist is that you can always work to broaden your peak. So even though I'm still not an expert on salmon aging methods, I learned something because somebody asked a question and then I checked. And like I said, I could have actually emailed Craig Primer, who is um, a friend of mine. He's about the same career stage as I am. But because I, I read the paper where this salmon paper that we discussed yesterday, and actually in the methods, it was sort of clear enough. I didn't have to email him. I, I thought that, you know, I'll, I'll just put the text that's in the paper um, about the relevant bit here. So that's what you see here. How do they know things about the fish they catch? So in the methods section of this paper, um, they say that the growth and the freshwater age, that is age before sea migration, um, so when they're really young, they're born in the freshwater and then they go to the sea. So how long do they uh, do this? Um, and years spent at sea before first sex maturation and spawning, referred to here as age at maturity, were inferred from scales using internationally agreed guidelines for Atlantic salmon scale reading. Um, so then I downloaded this document, um, so the ICES, which is the International, is it Committee or Commission, something like that, for the Exploration of the Seas. Um, they, have, they had a workshop on age determination of salmon, um, and they wrote a report, and it's quite a, it's a 14 megabyte document, and I downloaded it, and I looked at it, um, where people just from different countries interested in this topic, uh, they got together and they wanted to standardize how they do this. And there, for example, they, you know, this document, I didn't put that picture in here, but there was, figure one was basically a picture of a salmon. Um, and they said that, you know, sometimes it has been recommended that you look at the scales in this region, but we think it's actually better that everybody focuses on this region because there was some reliability 
stuff about it. So yesterday I was saying that you know they, they can look at things in this sort of ear structure, and that I think that is still true. But, but now that I've read this document, it turns out that you can also get quite a lot of information just by taking one scale, uh, which is. Okay, good. So, um, this is what you can see in the scale. Um, there's uh, the beginning of the rapid C growth phase. You can see that these are like tree rings, um, so that you, you the rings are much, much more spaced uh, apart uh, than they were in the beginning. And then you get the first winter minimum. I think it's a bit of a sort of art uh, how you uh, um, these experts they start interpreting this. And then here, um, this is the end of the winter band, and so on and so on. Um, and this is figure 5.13 reference points shown on the typical scale from a one SW. I don't know what that means. Maybe that it went through a summer and the winter or something like that. But basically, a young salmon. And there's lots of pictures in this document. And then you kind of like make the uh, inference from there, uh, including, uh, there was the question, how do they know how many times this thing has already spawned? Um, so there's this text, maybe it's not essential to read everything in that, the, the text actually goes on for longer in that document, but basically it says that the spawning mark results from the scale edge erosion caused by material being reabsorbed from the scale when the fish is in fresh water. Um, complete winter bands may be eroded, blah, blah, blah. And, and so on. But basically you can see the life history summary here that spawning marks occur in Atlantic salmon scale after spawning has taken place in the ages of one, two, three, or four. Repeated spawning can take place in consecutive years or in alternate years. Um, and yeah, so basically here they admit that yes, salmon do spawn many times. Uh, these are not the salmon that do it just once and die. Um, but if I trust these people, and I guess I do, um, it means that the first spawning is it's quite clear that you can age the salmon um, when it has been doing that. So, um, okay. okay, now let's mm. move back to that one, even though this actually also works quite nicely. Thank you. Okay, does it work? Yeah, good. Then there was also a question of um, maybe empirical studies of mate choice when you have these harassment things happening in there. And, um, and there, I guess there's kind of like two different categories of studies that one could look at. One is whether females prefer particular males over other males when there's also harassment in the system. And the other one is whether you just sort of avoid males altogether. You just want to reduce the rate of meeting males because everybody is kind of like a bit too much for you as a female. Um, so I'm showing you two studies here, one of each category. Um, there's of course more. I mean, if you start um, looking for more papers, um, I guess you sort of know how to do that. But the, you kind of like you find something, for example, on Web of Science or you find something on connectedpapers.com. Are you familiar with these platforms? Uh, there's some nodding. Um, and the, the, the thing is that often initially when students try to find something, they, if, especially if they're a little bit lazy, they come back and they tell me that, oh, there's nothing on this topic. And I'm like, really? Um, usually the problem is that if you don't know the exact keywords, uh, then scientific words are often <sighs> Like, like, for example, I, I, I know because I have worked in this field that people talk about things like coercive matings, they talk about harassment, uh, they talk about sexual conflict, 
but if you just Google with some sort of loose terms like like females avoiding males or something like that, it's too general and you don't you don't kind of focus very easily to the to what you really need to do. So usually it's already helpful if you find one paper that is a little bit close to your topic, then you read the paper so you learn the terminology that people are using and then it's much easier for you to start looking at uh, things. Or you can find maybe some popular science article, you, you look at whose paper are they actually, whose research are they talking about, then you go to that person's Google Scholar page, you find your first paper that way and then you you can sort of work through people or you can work through finding the actual proper keywords or of course textbooks, I mean sometimes there's an actual textbook on the topic. Um, but anyway, because I already work in this field, I, I was just a bit too slow yesterday to think through the best example immediately. But when I went to my hotel, then I was like, yeah, of course, there was, for example, this one. Um, so I actually took this from memory. Um, so what did they do? Um, the title says, females prefer males with superior fighting abilities, but avoid sexually harassing winners when eavesdropping on male fights. And that almost tells the entire story in, in just this title. Um, so what they did, um, it's a bit boring, I, I could have, I guess, put the graphs in there, but I, I just chose the text where they explain uh, what, they, what they found. They, they used video playback techniques and they presented females of this Mexican fish, uh, Poecilia mexicana, with two size matched males and they established association preferences. Um, and usually what you do in fish, made choice studies is that you, you have this sort of aquarium and you have a female in the middle and then there's some barrier. Um, depending on what cues you want to use, you might just put glass in between or plexiglass or something like that, in which case they can see but not smell. Or you might get some kind of like holes in that so that you, the idea is that if there's some olfactory preferences, they might also be able to smell whatever you want to do there. Um, but anyway, the female can observe something um, and half of the females could then observe the same two males fight and establish dominance. So then the f males, of course, are not in different parts of the aquarium, but they have to be together and fighting. And control females, so both males side by side, but physically separated. Um, and in this case, I imagine that they did it in such a way that if you have the female and the male and the male, then the males cannot see each other. So you have something that is not... Uh, transparent so that they don't interact um, but the female can see both and she can sort of check them out um, and female preferences were subsequently re-evaluated. Females in the control group showed a significant preference for future winners in the subsequent testing so that they can somehow evaluate kind of like oh that's a strong looking guy um, so some sort of innate preference for male traits that are indicative of physical superiority um, but when they are allowed to eavesdrop on male fights, so this was the first category of females, females did not show a preference for observed winners and they actually decreased time spent with them when they were you know, allowed to do so relative to the control treatment in which no fight was shown. And of course you can always sort of ask yourself like you know, in this sort of little short term behavioral experiments, you know, how strong is the evidence really? But at least it's consistent with the interpretation that um, Oh yeah, they also had a subsequent experiment where the contest winners were the ones who showed elevated levels of sexual behavior. So they argue that the temporary offset of the intrinsic female preference for dominant males after having observed a fight is driven by the females wanting to avoid the, those who harass too much. Um, so it's a bit of a complicated story, um, but th this is kind of the kind of work that people do in, in here. This is actually a simpler story. Um, guppies, they are very, very popular in um, sexual selection research. Um, and this is something like <laughs> the life of a female guppy in nature. It's just amazing. There's an estimate they get, they get a copulation attempt from a male about one, one per minute in their entire adult lives. <laughs> um, it's like, like if, if there's something that's a bit too much, it's like, you know, th this really is too much. Um, and um, they, uh, this is of course quite disruptive. I mean, it's not like physically dangerous or anything like that, but, but when it interacts with the feeding efficiency and things like that, people have actually looked at a lot about the energy consumption of, you know, just sort of trying to, you know, deal with life with in that situation. And this paper um, shows 
uh, if you read the title, male harassment drives females to alter habitat use and leads to segregation of the sexes. So this is a situation where there's, there's areas in nature, um, so the wild guppies, they are in Trinidad, um, and um, in some areas the stream is shallow, and in some other areas of the same stream it's deep, so that in principle a fish can choose. And the predators of these guppies, they live in the deeper waters, did I get it right? And um, this is interesting because the males are brighter colored and the water is not always clear, so the males are actually at higher risk uh, throughout their lives. Um, this is another reason why lifespans can differ between males and females, in this case in a fish. Um, and so the males don't really like to go very much where the predators are. The females don't really like to go either where the predators are, but it has the advantage that there's no males there. So they could show here that, <laughs> that um, females actually trade off, they're kind of like, you know, they, they show a pre I'd rather be with a predator than, <laughs> than with, the, with, with these kind of amazing numbers of, of males. And of course, it's not completely black and white. I mean, it's not 100%, you know, just sort of go there. But, uh, but they did show this, if you, if you read this, um, deep water in rivers with la large piscivorous fishes is less optimal habitat for male than female guppies. However, females still, they, I mean, they would be at lower risk from predation if they went to the shallow water where the males are, but they actually do prefer the deeper water there. So uh, that's kind of for entertainment. Um, then I also happened to mention this. I, I couldn't remember, was this a preprint or is it already published? Um, it is actually already published. Uh, this is the Biobank study on sexually antagonistic selection on humans. And my memory was a little bit um, uh, wrong in the sense that I was talking about the sort of health aspects of these people. Um, the Biobank studies are often used to look at health. Uh, but in this case, they actually went for um, much more direct fitness measures like actual survival and reproductive success. I mean, this is not something that we... You know, sometimes you hear that, you know, humans these days with medical care and all these kind of things, you know, there's no evolution anymore because everybody survives. But of course, I mean, it is not true. There, is, there are deaths, not terribly common in children, but they, they do occur. And also, if you think about reproductive success, if you just measure the, you know, number of children, which today is often a choice thing, not necessarily a sort of the same, it's not the same as in the guppies, but still there are differences. So, for example, if you if you never marry, if you, or if you otherwise don't end up in a relationship that allows you to have kids, then you know, there could be some traits in principle that have an impact on this. And they say that they actually uncover polygenic se signals of sex differential selection affecting survival, reproductive success, and overall fitness, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, just the end of the abstract that you can, cannot see there, I put it in a bigger font. Overall, our results are consistent with polygenic sex differential, including sexually antagonistic, selec selec sexually antagonistic selection in humans. Evidence is particularly strong for variants affecting reproductive success rather than survival, because survival is kind of quite good up to old ages, uh, mostly in the UK. Um, but in reproductive success, the potential contributions of non-random sampling to signals of sexual sex differentiation can be excluded. So, um, you know, for example, infertility problems do exist, we all know that, and therefore, if there's any kind of genes impacting that, then, yeah, selection actually is ongoing. But this was just comments. Um, we, and I'll go through the... Actually, are there other questions about these comments before I go to the elephants again? No, this was just an update based on the questions yesterday. So, yesterday at the end, there was this question of how I actually modeled this situation, because I had this one-fourth things, um, and um, the half and the half for the other kinds of females. So you remember the story here, we have these tuskless females, uh, which are the X, X star uh, things there, and then we have the males always having the tusks, and then we have the situation where um, a certain kind of embryo is always assumed to die, uh, the other ones live, and then we have this two-thirds of the offspring being born female when you have a taskless mother. And then the way I had modeled this is that um, I, 
I can't show the MATLAB code simultaneously, so I'll just put the code roughly from memory onto the uh, onto here. I had the number of F those females that have those are, I think the notation I had the small b because their tusks are small and they don't they are not visible from inside the skin. And, and then I multiplied it, uh, there, there was this birth rate in the, in the beginning, 1 over uh, 3.5, yeah? Do you want to put them both? Yes, um, the, okay, so I, I need to, yes, uh, okay, how do I do this, that, that one? Oh, panic, panic, okay, so, somebody knows how this works, <laughs> yeah. In the meanwhile, I should maybe put the light on when I do the uh, the thing on the on here. Right, so what I had done in the code, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the code in a moment, um, is that there was this line, there was one over 3.5 in front of that, and then there was the number of females that are taskless, and then I had a one-fourth, one-fourth, one-fourth as the types of offspring that they are producing. So this is a vector that produces equal numbers, each of them, and then um, if you look at these numbers, they sum up to three quarters. And then I had uh, the other type of female. These are the old fashioned tusked females. Um, they never produce the tuskless offspring because they don't have that sort of chromosome. And they produce a sex ratio of one half, one half. And then um, there was this question kind of like, is this really, you know, is this the way you should do this? And I, I think it is the way you should do this. So what I have done here to, simplify the code, I don't know, maybe it's actually kind of more difficult to understand than if I had not done this, but anyway, I simplified the code by never having a category of the m small b, because these always die, so I don't even have to track their numbers, which means that I only have these three numbers in here, and they are not frequencies, so they don't sum up to one necessarily. They are um, actual numbers of offspring that this female is producing. So if she has, uh, maybe I'll actually put the one, the ratio in the beginning that I had in there. Um, so every 3.5 years, she um, produces something, but there's only a three quarters probability that this actually works because one quarter of them die. So it's actually correct that this doesn't sum up to one. And the sex ratio is actually two thirds here because um, this is twice the number that, and these are the two types of females, and this is the one type of male that they can produce. So I think it's correct. And for the, yeah, this one is, is sort of obvious. So again, every, I'm um, assuming that they reproduce equally often. That's actually an assumption we could maybe talk about, but for now I've assumed that. Um, and they never produce that, and the, they produce the one half sex ratio and guaranteed every 3.5 years they do produce a baby. Okay, so that's how it worked. And if I now go back to the, uh, the full screen thing, which one is it, this one? With the mouse. With the mouse. Notebook. Notebook, okay. Okay, now I've learned something. So, um, I built the model and I'm going to go uh, to the code. Uh, and this is just for me to remind what sort of um, values lead to a nice example that we can start working with. Uh, the code is, oh, I need to get rid of the slideshow. 
do that. The code is here. I'll get rid of the light. So last time we were stuck at this point, so we had the um, so we have always this whole thing in two versions. We have the one without the mutant being initiated and then with the mutant, but this thing is otherwise completely the same. So we have the uh, quarters here, we have the, these lines there. And then uh, we need to figure out, okay, um, survival of the adults and then we add the newborns to the population as well. Um, and here I made the simplification that the newborns become adults pretty immediately and we are going to talk about that in a moment. Um, so there's actually two things that I would immediately criticize my model with. One is the, you know, should this number be the same for both types and I will talk about that. And then the other one is this too fast maturation of the young. But uh, let's first see what this, this was all that I had time uh, to create. Uh, so let's see what, it hap what happens in here. So um, the next year, I'm not saying next generation because this is an overlapping generations model. Elephants live quite a long time. So I'm just going from one year to the next. Um, we take the previous year, we multiply that with these S values that I'm giving here. Um, and <laughs> this is MATLAB notation. I could also do it in R where it would be a bit different, but the, the dot before the multiplication sign, that means that if I have three numbers in on this row here for the NN here, then this also has three numbers and I'm just doing it point by point. If I don't do it with the point, then uh, MATLAB is something that always assumes that I'm doing matrix multiplication where the rules are a bit different and therefore it gets confused and wrong and all that. So if you're wondering why this point here is as a notation, that's the reason. So I'm always uh, multiplying three numbers uh, with each other or adding uh, three numbers here. Um, so I have the, okay, so the previous females and males uh, multiplied by their survival. This is a vector of three numbers as well. I have to give it here as three numbers. And then um, what do I have here? One, hunting mortality, hunting mortality. Uh, so these are the survival values due to human action. So if human action is set to zero, um, so if I set hunting mortality to zero, this is just multiplying by one, one, and one. So nothing changes. Whereas if I have hunting mortality 0.5, it means that every year you take 50% of all the ones with the tasks. Um, and these are safe, of course. These are the taskless ones, so they are not impacted by this ever. And then to that number, this is the adult survivals, uh, survivors, and I just add the newborns to it. And again, the newborns are three different numbers because they are come from here, okay? And that's all. The rest is just plotting. Um, and if I do this, and this time I'm faster than yesterday because I already started MATLAB. Um, so what I'm doing here is that I type um, elephant and now I'm giving it the values 95% um, survival from one year to the next for adults if they're female of either category, so two, two times the value uh, 0.95. And for males, I put a tiny bit of a lower one, not for any real reason, except that um, then I can see the male curve a bit different from the female curve. So it's a bit easier to see that, you know, where is the male curve actually. But of course, I mean, you can put them identical, then they're just, the colors are on top of each other. Um, why did I choose 0.95? I, I downloaded one paper on elephant life histories and there was some, Somewhere uh, there was a study saying that the yearly survival actually fluctuates, but in some years it was just 1% mortality, sometimes it was 15% mortality, um, but the, um, mo in most years it's actually quite fine. And then I just thought, oh, let's just try with 5% here. Um, that's why the survival is 0.95. Also, it creates an example that's quite nice. So when I do this, I, I decided to plot it in different ways. Um, in figure one and figure two. Um, so in figure one, you uh, see the y-axis is uh, linear and in figure two, it's always logarithmic. Sometimes it doesn't look so logarithmic, but it actually is, it just varies very little. And I'm plotting things also with absolute numbers as well as frequencies. And this is the 
the top row is always the case without the mutant and the bottom row is when I've added this one taskless mutant in the beginning. So what do we see here? Um, firstly, you notice that the model doesn't include density dependence. Um, so uh, if the population is able to grow, then in a thousand years you will get crazy, crazy, crazy many elephants. This is just a feature of the model that for now I'm actually not choosing to criticize because we are dealing, we are actually just dealing with the first, you know, 20 years or something like that. I just decided to plot it over a hundred years to see whether, oh sorry, a thousand years to see, to make you realize just how quickly things can grow when they look at that. So on a log scale, exponential growth looks linear. That's something that is, I guess, familiar to you. Um, so this just confirms that. But the log scale is also nice because it makes the mutant growth visible even when, as a frequency, they don't manage to make it. Uh, so, so what do we learn from here? If we look at the mutant's effect, um, this is a situation where the population is not hunted. I put the situation, the hunting mortality was zero. So no wonder the elephants are doing fine. They, are, they keep growing. Um, the, the mutant, the taskless ones, actually, in principle, they would be able to grow as well, you can see. But their frequency goes down. At the end, it's 10 to the minus 30. And of course, in any finite population, you know, uh, you, you basically predict that this mutant is not going to make it. Also because in reality, um, you could put some sort of density dependence onto this population. Um, you would never get, uh, the world will never have 10 to the power of 41 elephants. Um, so therefore, if you put some density dependence on it and everybody's survival is depressed to the same degree, then you would predict that um, the absolute number is stabilized somewhere and this one really, you know, goes away. Um, no chance. Uh, and, and of course, intuition suggests that this should happen because there's no benefit of being taskless if the only effect is that your, half of your sons are killed. Okay. Kind of easy. But then uh, we can go and increase the hunting. What value do you want to put? I had zero there. How many, what percentage of tusked elephants should be killed? You can choose. 10%? Okay, 10%, 0.9. Oh, sorry, 0.1, I have to put in there. So, interesting. Um, it's kind of where, where should we start? It's maybe, e maybe it would be good first to look at the top row. So if the taskless version has not appeared, um, the absolute numbers are going down. They keep going down. Um, you take uh, too many elephants, I mean 10% every year, that is actually quite a lot um, because these are long-lived animals. You take 10% every year. They, they only reproduce, remember, um, once every 3.5 years and only half of these are actually females. So, so the population growth rate is actually quite low. It cannot withstand such a high poaching pressure. Um, so even though on an absolute scale it looks like this is kind of like getting nicer towards the end, you can see from the log plot that the rate of decline is actually the same and this will deterministically go extinct. Uh, the frequencies, uh, there's a bit of a difference. So the red ones, as you can guess, are the females and the blue ones are the males. Um, so there's a little bit of a biased sex ratio here where the there's a bit more females than males just as a consequence of me choosing a tiny bit of a different survival for them. I just wanted to make the curves a bit different, um, but it's not a sort of big deal there. Um, and on a log scale, yeah, MATLAB just chose to put the axis so that you can see them uh, not from zero to something, but to from 0.48 something to whatever it is. But then when we have the mutant in there, you can see that again, we get crazy many elephants. And we get crazy many elephants of all, ty all three types, including the tusked ones, which is really interesting. So what happens here is that um, the frequency initially is very low for the tusk-free ones, and it goes up to uh, something a bit less than 
And that is actually enough to make the situation stabilize. Because you, you remember that the, the taskless ones, they always also produce the tasked ones. Um, and the task ones, so they, they are, of course, they have a sort of something is favoring them as well because they actually are better at creating total numbers of offspring. And you get this very interesting frequency dependence here um, where um, there, most of the population actually has tasks, uh, but the few that don't have them, they, they kind of rescue the entire population. Um, I, I actually found this really cool. You know, I, I just created this like, was it yesterday? No, the day before. Um, and on a log scale, yeah, basically it just looks like this. Uh, everything ke just keeps growing. Yes? Could you refresh my memory about the genotypes? So yes. Uh, um, for that, I need to go back to this slide here. So there's, um, this is. So the, the one with, uh, okay, there, okay, there aren't, there, the, there are I, was, I was thinking of the image you, you had showed before, had shown before of the elephant with two tasks, the elephant yeah. with only one task. Yeah, the one task so ones, I, you, you yeah, I, I just decided to ignore them because people don't really know, <laughs> know. Yeah, I mean, like I said, biology is always a bit more complicated than you want it to be. If I, if I go to this slide here, I mean, the, um, I have simplified the situation where in reality um, you have this one tasked one here. Um, and, and also in the, in the paper, they don't really talk about them. They, it seems to be some sort of a slightly sort of intermediate form that, you know, the, because they talk actually about more than one gene being present in this region. Uh, there's the AMELX gene uh, that I was talking about, but there's also in this region, there's actually all kinds of things that have to do with how your teeth and bones work. And therefore it might be that, you know, there's a bit more variation and a bit more different kinds of combinations in there. Um, but the main point that I wanted to take from this is that if, like, they, they had also simplified the story here. They, they were just looking at the maternal phenotype between this and that. And then they showed that, well, actually you get three different types. Um, but the point is that you get half, you get e about equally many this type as that type. And then you have these undecided ones, um, which I've just chosen to, you know, remove from the model for my usual approach. Um, let's understand the simple thing first and then try to figure out, you know, what might be going on in there. B also because I, I don't know how often these ones would be killed by the hunters. Uh, you know, they, it's kind of like a, there's some ivory in there, but it's less profitable than another one if you see them simultaneously. So, so uh, yeah. The, the tuskless ones, you suppose uh, no hunting mortality for them? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming okay. no. I, I'm assuming they're completely safe. Okay. okay. And so. w whenever I say that, you know, I'm assuming this or I'm assuming that, then if you wanted to, I could actually upload the uh, code. Um, and if you use some other program, you know, this would be quite easy to translate into other programs because the math is actually very simple. Um, you could, you can always say that, well, if I want to make alternative assumptions, uh, let's play with it. And let's, you know, if we had more time on this course, I would actually create some computer exercises and you could alter something that, that where I'm saying that, I'm not totally happy with my assumption here because I didn't have so much time. You could use time to play with it and see what happens and understand it uh, better. Good questions in there, yeah. So, um, do you want to try even higher mortality? Yes, you want to. How, how high should I put it? 0.5. Point 0.5, oh God. <laughs> yeah, we can do it. Um, that's interesting because even with 0.5, if you have the safe taskless one in there, you can see that the populations will grow. Uh, initially they crash because you know, this is you know, the only the, almost only the mutant is left. But the mutant is able to produce um, itself and then it will also uh, always produce, uh, the, the mutant is something that, well, it's no longer a mutant when it's almost fixed, but, the, but it's always able to produce all types. So therefore, you know, now just uh, the, the males are still being produced just as they should, but the male's mother is now um, a tuskless one. Uh, so therefore, you know, 
yeah, um, it works. So the frequency, you can see that the frequency of the, no, these are also the tusks, sorry. Um, there must be the other females there in, in there as well. So they, they are just behind the blue curve, right? Yes, that was, that was probably your question coming. Yes, now that I think through it. And you can actually see it. I mean, this is, the frequency of this is close to 80%, but not completely. And then you have less than 20% here. So there must be, yeah, it, it adds up to one when you have the, um, I could make the male survival still a little bit more different. So then you could see these ones being a bit away from each other as well. Okay. Do you want to try any other values? Also the survival you can vary if you want to. So, so, that it, um, so in this example, um, I chose this 5%, 5%, 6% as mortality. So the survival is, is quite high. Um, I looked at um, this literature and, and in some years it's higher, but mortality is higher, so survival is lower. But if I run this example, because I tried, um, it's actually fairly sensitive that if I put, for example, now I make all of them equal, and let's go back to 10% mortality. Um, it's not very good at surviving, even when I have the tuskless ones in there, if survival is only 90% per year, um, because their reproductive rate is really quite low. So then you just get these extinctions. So even though the frequency stabilize, uh, the, the population actually crashes, so, which is logical. And this actually brings me to some criticism here because I, I felt like I'm actually being too optimistic about these elephants here because I'm assuming that the offspring mature so quickly. Um, and uh, when I go back to my slides, I actually felt like, because this was just a numerical exploration, but you could do better things if you wanted to by um, going to matrix calculations um, and this is now something where I don't know how much you have been exposed to matrix algebra modeling of population growth. Have you ever done these kind of things? Okay, so I, I'm not going to talk about this very long because for this example, it was actually not so uh, fruitful because they are so terribly long lived. But the, but the point is that um, I tried to put the long juvenile growth uh, period into the model um, and do a proper matrix analysis of the graphs that you showed there with population growth. Um, there's, a, there's a whole book called Matrix Population Dynamics or Matrix, well, something like that, uh, where they explain these methods which are very powerful but they come with the downside that they are mostly powerful if you ignore density dependence. And of course, density dependence is something very prevalent. So therefore, you know, it's, it's useful to know what can be done there. But, um, but usually you don't get analytical results out of it if you have included density dependence, except sometimes you can if it's a very simple form and all that. But so it's worth trying and I tried, um, but even without density dependence, I actually didn't get very far, but I can, I can tell you what I tried here. So I moved to, to a different program, uh, Mathematica, and I created this horrible looking thing, but <laughs> I'll explain what happens in there. It w it, and it's actually easier with a shorter structure that I also, I have on the next slide, but I'll first try and explain what I tried to do with the complete structure. So what you have in here is uh, two sub matrices and there's actually one number linking them both, uh, which is up there. Um, and I think I need to use the blackboard because this is just so small and terrible. I'll start explaining what I want to say. So if you have a population, and now I put a vertical uh, vector in here, where we have the, we have the number of the FB individuals, the small b, and we have the number of the tusked ones, and then we have the, and I will actually not include the males. Uh, matrix population modeling is usually done just by looking at the females. 
And the mails I'm now putting into the system in a very implicit way, just by saying that I know that they are all of a particular kind. They are all of a kind that only gives the X chromosome to the next generation. Um, and that takes care of the dynamics. And my question is, I want to go from time t to t plus 1. And um, if, if I do that, um, I will actually first explain it with the, with the second model that I uh, uh, produced here, which is just ignoring the fact that the juveniles have such a long survival period. Um, so here, oh, now it's so small that you can't see it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't plan this very well. You can see this, but I'll, I'll, I'll just ex let's let's get rid of the elephants for a moment. Let's let's try something like uh, something that doesn't have these different types. Uh, something that just has juveniles and adults. Okay, salmon. <laughs> so we have the juveniles and we have adults, and the life cycle is simple because juveniles become adults and then adults produce juveniles. Uh, so this is, this is like as simple as it gets. So if we have right now, we have, let's say that we have like a thousand juveniles and they are not very good at surviving because small fish are often not very good at becoming big fish. So we have 10 adults. So this is our state. And then how do we, how do we know what happens in the next time step? Um, if we have, Okay, so here, here we do know that only one in a hundred uh, survived, uh, but in general we could actually just start from a non-equilibrium situation, so these could be just whatever numbers you put in a, in a body of water. And let's say that we have a bit of a higher survival. We have 0.1 as a survival here, and each adult produces 100 juveniles. And, and then we, oh, let's say 200, uh, a nice, nicely growing population. Um, we want to predict kind of like, you know, what are the numbers here? And wh when the system is so simple, I mean, you can of course do this kind of like, okay, calculate this and then that and then that and then that, but you can also make it into sort of more formal representation uh, with matrix algebra, where you say that because we have two different stages. Uh, we have the juveniles and adults, and we have the future juveniles and future adults. We ask, in this corner, how many juveniles are juveniles producing? Well, they aren't producing any juveniles yet because they are not yet mature, so we get the number zero here. And then we ask, um, how many adults is each juvenile producing? Well, juveniles are producing adults by becoming adults, but each juvenile can only maximally produce one of them because that's what you first, you transform into that thing. And if they do that uh, with a probability 0.1, then you put number 0.1 here. Well, do adults create adults directly? Well, that depends. If you have an overlapping generations model, they, by surviving, they actually do contribute an adult to the next generation. Um, and that, in a life cycle like this, you would then have a... And, and we could, you know, like in the salmon case, in the Atlantic salmon, they could actually survive. So we could put some number here. Let's say 80% of them survive. So you would put 0.8 here. And then, this is really important what's here, because the adults are supposed to produce juveniles. Otherwise, reproduction doesn't happen. And they're really good at doing this, so you get this sort of matrix. So whatever life cycle you have, you can, um, you can create a matrix that describes all the different loops and arrows and things like that that happen in there. Um, and in matrix algebra, there you can do tricks with this where you can, for example, predict the stable age distribution of a population uh, directly from the properties of this. You can predict the growth rate. Um, you, uh, the, the terms that you use if you want to do this um, is that you look for the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the matrix. Some of you are nodding, so some of you probably have heard this before. Um, so if I, for example, put this matrix into, um, let's go to, oh, I have to get something in here. It was this one? No, no. no. Ah. 
Oh, with the mouse. I've, why, why am I so slow at learning? Notebook. Yeah. Okay. If I go to MATLAB, is the font big enough? Maybe. Uh, not sure. And then I just say I've got a matrix that is 0 to 100 and 0 0.1, 0 0.8. And I ask for the, I hope it was actually eigenvalues because I was just using Mathematica. MATLAB has a different name for that, but the, it was not that. It was eig, yes. Okay, the eigenvalues, there's two of them and the largest one is the one that is relevant. Um, so uh, we know that the, from this we know that the 4.89 is an incredibly good growth, growth rate. Um, this is because they, each of the adults was able to produce 200 juveniles and the juveniles were actually quite good at uh, get, becoming adults so we get a, you know, a really massive uh, growth rate. This is basically the, the thing that, you know, you're on a logistic plot, how steep is that uh, curve that you are producing there. And then, um, how do I, because I, I haven't done this in MATLAB for a while, the eigenvectors, so I, I just need to ask for two outputs. Okay, so what I got here is um, two, two uh, things where the latter value of Ds, this is the 4.89, um, that predicts how good the population is growing and that is also relevant for, the, for choosing which eigenvector we should look at. Um, and because this is the second one, it means that we are going to look at the uh, second row there, uh, second column, sorry. So, and we have, confusingly, we have two negative numbers in there, but this is, this is really not relevant. All you have to do, they, they are all just relative to each other. We can, we can make them positive, we can make them, one of them one, and divide by the number uh, that is there. That was not a good explanation. Um, I'll, I'll just say that the eigenvectors that we actually want to look at um, is the second column of V. So these are the two numbers that we want to stare at. And um, I can normalize this whatever way I like. I can, for example, ask for each juvenile that is in the population, how many adults are there? Which means that I can take the eigenvector and normalize it so that I divide by the first value of it, in which case everything becomes positive and nicely um, scaled. So now I finally have the prediction of the age structure in the population while it's growing, so that for every juvenile that I have in the population, I have only 0.0244 adults. I could have also done it uh, and I can still do it, I, I can change these as much as I like, uh, normalize it with a second one so that I can get the prediction that for every adult I have more than 40 juveniles while the population is growing. So the, this model has no density dependence in it, so it doesn't stabilize to any particular number, but while it's growing, it's going to grow with this age structure, which is kind of like a, like in human populations you have these age pyramids uh, that, you know, in a fast-growing population, there's many, many more young ones as old ones. Um, and this is just a, kind of like the shortest possible age pyramid that I had there. So this is, yeah. The, oh, okay. Oh, I thought you had a question. So this is what I was trying to do with the elephants with complications, because the elephants are complicated, um, where instead of just sort of one matrix where there's different ages. Um, I have the different ages there, but then I also have the different classes of females because of 
them having tasks or not. So um, what I created, and um, then I didn't get, actually get very far because I tried to solve for the eigenvectors and it just produced something that was unmotivating. Um, <laughs> 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 so the, so, but but uh, what I tried to do here is, uh, you can see that a very similar thing to what I was doing here um, is in the top right corner, um, but I, I have now 14 different juvenile classes because I read somewhere that it takes them, they, they, it takes them as long to become a teenager as it takes humans to become a teenager. Um, so um, I, I wanted them to have to survive through all these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on steps before they become uh, these things that actually then contribute also in this top right corner to the big, to creating new juveniles. Um, so I have, um, in, there's a lot of zeros here because a four year old elephant baby never contributes directly to the class of six year old elephant babies or eight year old elephant babies. They can only contribute to the one that is just below the diagonal because if they survive, they become one year older. That's why the S's are not exactly on the diagonal, but they're a bit below. Just like this, this is actually like one below the diagonal. So it's the same thing, but just more, more structure. Then um, here I have the just before mature ones, they become mature. And then once they are mature, then I have this one minus hunting pressure survival. So this is basically that, that value here, which is the loop that you don't change where you are in the column and row R thing, you just stay in the same one. So if you survive as an adult and if you avoid the poachers, then you are allowed to contribute to this class still. And while you're in this class, you can also contribute to, how did I put the notation in there? I put one over two T. And uh, the one over two is now the fact that I'm only counting the females in this model. Um, so half of them are males, but they are sort of implicit in this kind of modeling. Uh, and the T is, I, I just chose that to represent, you know, the time that it takes, the interbirth interval. Um, and that, and I, I, I tried to put it first as a, as a letter I, but then Mathematica interpreted that as the imaginary number, so I, I, I didn't like that. So I, I put the T there as in the time interval. So then um, there's the other type of elephants. Um, these are the ones that have that don't have the tasks because they just survive fine. They don't have the hunting impacting them. Otherwise, exactly the same idea. And they are in separate parts of this matrix because they, they do their own thing. Um, a survival of a six-year-old taskless one, even though the young ones might not have the tasks, you know, they genotypically, I know that they have to contribute to their own type in the future, not, not they don't suddenly move to the other, other part. But there's this interaction that when they reproduce, that's the only time when the, these ones can actually start contributing to the ones that are in the first 15 rows and columns. So then I, I really have to think like, where does it even go in the matrix? Um, so these ones can make new ones of their own type, which I have, you know, the, these are all the rows that refer to that but they can also produce new ones of this type. Yes. I'm, not, I'm confused, so. Okay, me uh, too. <laughs> I, couldn't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't abstract too easily from the, the two by two matrix example to this one. Okay. So the upper left, uh, yes. uh, upper, I'll, I'll, I'll draw upper right. Keep, keep talking, I'll, I'll draw something on the blackboard. Okay, yeah. The, yeah. The, the upper right sub corner, uh, sub matrix, I do not understand why the first line is, uh, why you have so only the corners with a value? Yeah, uh, it's, it's because juveniles don't reproduce yet. Um, it might be clearer okay. if, I have, if, I, if I draw a slightly longer matrix here in the simple case. So what if we had a fish that takes a bit longer, like the late come back, late returning Wait. salmon. If we had a juvenile of a one year old, a juvenile that is two year old, and then you come back to the stream and you become an adult. So this is a slightly longer one. So you need to do these transitions before you do this transition. And then you can also do this. 
then we would need a three by three matrix. So it's not as crazy as the elephant one yet, but we would have a zero here, 0.1 here. I'll, I'll, I'll put the numbers in here first and then I'll start explaining. Um, zero, 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 and 200. Okay, so the way we interpret this now um, is that this is the juveniles, the young juveniles, this is the slightly older juveniles, and this is the adults. So, and uh, one, two, and adults. So if you are a young juvenile and you survive, you don't stay a ju young juvenile, you become an old juvenile, and that number comes in here. Um, the co if you're a young juvenile, you also don't directly contribute to adults. So this number is zero. Um, likewise, if you are a, an older juvenile, you don't produce young juveniles because you are not mature yet. Um, if you're an old juvenile, you don't contribute to the future old juveniles because you become an adult instead. So you, if, if you get more complex life cycles, um, you end up with a lot of zeros in the matrix because most of these transitions just don't happen. And that's why um, you can see that already in this model, there's a lot of zeros on the top row. It's only the last one that is a positive value because it's only the adults who can produce new juveniles. Uh, I, see that, I see that perhaps I have fabricated an idea. I thought the adults had been split up into age classes too, but they are a single class. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. And, so and here, so I only the juveniles have been split into ages. Exactly. Okay. So, so I needed to keep track of every juvenile class separately because it's very different what happens to three-year-olds than to 14-year-olds because the 14-year-olds are almost mature and they actually do become mature in the next if they survive one more time. Whereas the, juven the younger juveniles, they have so many years still ahead of them before they need to um, do this. It's also possible to do a life table or a matrix where the old adults are treated differently from the younger adults. Uh, for example, if you have senescence, that the, the old ones, they stop being so reproductively active. So here I'm just assuming that if you're an adult, every year you just behave in the same way. And that's why you have only one of the reproductive classes in there. Well, actually two, because two different kinds of females. Yeah, I, I was expecting that you would say, oh, up to, uh, uh, after a certain point, they, they produce less offspring and... Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not, like, this is not a menopause model or, or something <laughs> like that. Uh, I mean, those models can also be constructed, but this is, when you have a thing like this, then you're assuming that um, you just have effectively translates into an exponentially distributed lifespan because every year that you survive, you are not older in this, you're chronologically older, but you're not physiologically older. You just come back to the same state and you can keep doing this with a certain probability every year. Can you I, yeah, an assumption, yeah. And can, so now that I have got this right, can you explain again the, the cell in the middle where you have the hunting uh, probability and... and yeah. I, I don't get why that term age will not appear in the in the next classes of juvenile after 14, after that point. Um, I'm assuming here that the juveniles don't have the tasks yet. Um, so they are, I'm assuming that they're safe, but I actually don't know at what age do they start showing them. I'm just assuming that it coincides with the maturity. But if you think that the older juveniles are already at risk, then you would start putting the age also here. And this is something that you could try. You could try to see what, what it, you know, how it, how it matters. So then what I was trying to do here with the eigenvectors was to, I was sort of dreaming that maybe because it's always the same S in so many different places that maybe Mathematica can simplify it into a very nice expression of, you know, when does the mutant take over and all those kind of things. Um, but this became, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I lost the will to live when I saw this. Um, <laughs> but, the, but then I, I decided to, I mean, you could still do this numerically um, because the way matrix, the matrices are then used 
um, instead of the kind of ugly MATLAB code that I um, that worked and produced these nice examples, but if I wanted to do it in a matrix algebra way, then um, there's a handy memory trick. If, if you don't remember matrix multiplication, like I always forget it when I haven't do, done it for a while, which is that um, in, a, in a nice mathematical way, um, you just say that, okay, the matrix, uh, because there I called it L, why did I call it L? I can't remember. Um, if, if this is now the thing with the different numbers, and then your population, let's call it N, um, it's like in this case, you would have three different numbers in there. You have the, you have a thousand juveniles, young juveniles, and then you have oh, whatever, maybe only a hundred left here, and then you have 10 adults. And then you're asking if they then reproduce according to this rules, what is the, if this is at, at NT, what is NT plus one? Um, so, in matrix algebra, you just do a matrix multiplication between L and A, oh, sorry, N. And this will be NT plus one. But how the matrix algebra works, because you're multiplying a vector with a matrix, it's always sort of hard to remember. It's, there's kind of like a logical, like I multiply this with that, and the, this with that, and that with that, and that's correct, so that it recapitulates what's here. But the way I always, I was taught to remember it, and it really works well, is that you put the, 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 the matrix you put here, and here are the numbers that I've already forgotten, and then your current population you put here, this is the NT, so it has three numbers, and then your outcome will be there. Um, and you, you can also check that you know, the numbers have to match, otherwise, otherwise this, you know, there has to be an equally, equally sized thing coming from here to there. So you do need a, um, if, if, if you make a mistake in your coding, then the, uh, like if you had only specified the first two rows, this would never work, and MATLAB would give you a, a red message and, and all that, but you need the, Three by three matrix here. You have divide. You have got all your, you know, two hundred and all the zeros are in place and so on. And then mentally, if you do this on pen and paper, um, you draw these correspondence curves. And now you can see that to get this number here, you choose this row, and there's only one column. Um, so the new number of juveniles is zero times the old number of juveniles plus zero times t the old number of um, older juveniles plus 200 times the number of adults. And now you can see it actually makes sense because the new number of juveniles, they are only produced by adults. So this is a logical, way to put it in there. And then you're asking, what is the new number of old, no, older juveniles? Okay, here we had the, I can't remember what I had in there, maybe 0.1, one, one. and this was zero, and this was zero. So 0.1 times the old number of um, young juveniles because the young juveniles, by surviving, they become old juveniles, plus zero times the older juveniles, because if they have survived, they are no longer older juveniles, plus zero times uh, adults, because the adults don't directly produce older juveniles. So whatever you have in your life cycle, like this is, this is a quite a simple one, because there's a lot of zeros, but here, for example, you have these transitions between the systems. It's always a very organized way of not forgetting some classes once you have put them all, all in there. And it has the advantage that didn't work out here because you know the eigenvectors and things like that, they sometimes allow you to kind of make statements that are analytically solvable. In the complete model, I didn't manage, 
but I actually did manage with the simplified model when I kind of gave up here and I went back to the incorrect but simplifying assumption uh, that the juveniles become adults very quickly. And, and, and I, I do that not because real elephants do it that way, but because then I can actually show that um, analytical stuff can happen. And now if I get rid of myself here again, now I remember to use the mouse. Okay. So if um, I now go to a very simplified life cycle here, and so this is kind of like taking the one that you had in, ma in Mathematica, uh, but I've now made the male dynamics just implicit. I'm just uh, taking the male dynamics into account by the fact that there's this one-way movement from the tusked, sorry, tuskless females can produce both um, tusked and tuskless uh, offspring, but the tusked females only produce tusked offspring. Okay, so this is what I'm uh, what I'm doing here, um, and as you can see, I've got the one over three point five there, and I've got the one quarter ideas there. And then um, if you are an XX female, this is the task female, instead of dividing by four, I'm dividing by two because half of their young are female and they are all with tasks. Mix everybody with me. And if you look at the arrows, I, you know, it's kind of like this sort of structure here, but I'm just sort of ignoring the, the whole juvenile business. The juveniles become adults immediately, so therefore there's only two classes of females. Um, they, they just produce females of each type. And then uh, because this model has now become so simple, um, I can actually do analytical stuff with it using matrix algebra. So if I do the not, you know, these are numbers here, but, uh, but the, I just say F for fecundity is this uh, one divided by 3.5 uh, divided by two. So here I have F divided by two plus S, and this is F plus S one minus H and so on. Then I went to Mathematica again and I was much more successful with solving this thing. So what is here? Uh, I forgot to put some animation in there. I, I didn't want you to see everything in one go, but okay. Uh, what is here? Um, so I have called this matrix now A. I always change notation. You have to get used to this. Uh, it's a flexibility of thinking, I guess I'm, I'm forcing you to do here. So this is the F plus S uh, one minus H, uh, F divided by two, zero, and F divided by two plus this is This is basically the matrix that I'm creating for this system. There's only two classes and um, as you can see, how have I actually chosen this? Is the tusked ones are the first class because they are impacted by the age. Um, and, and the second column describes what is happening with the tuskless ones. Um, so the tusked ones, which are the first column, they can never produce uh, tuskless ones. That's why there's a zero. Whereas the tusk, sorry, tuskless ones can produce tusk, <laughs> it's so hard with the words, <laughs> tusk ones, um, and they can also produce uh, offspring of their own kind without tusks, and by surviving they can keep being tuskless themselves as adults. So this is the matrix form, and this is um, so much simpler than the, what you saw on the previous page, uh, that when I asked for the eigenvalues of this, um, I always, by the way, if you have a two by two matrix, you always get two eigenvalues and you have to choose which one's relevant, which one is actually the one that is describing population growth. And the dominant eigenvalue is always the largest one. But here, it's not immediately obvious which one's actually larger. And I, as you can see, one of them is impacted by the hunting, H, and the other one is not. So depending on if the hunting pressure is large or small, one of them may be larger or smaller than the other. Okay, so I'm, when you're looking at this, this is luckily simple enough, it's very easily solvable. Uh, so if the hunting is greater than F divided by 2S, then the left one is larger, otherwise the right one is larger. 
Um, and when I'm looking for the eigenvectors, remember this is now about the distribution of, you know, what, how, what proportion would you predict there to be, the tasks versus taskless ones. Um, you can see that there's two options here. One possibility is uh, that for every, this was now the taskless one, for every taskless one, you have this many um, tasked ones, and don't be confused by the minus here, this, this whole thing might still be positive, we have to see. Or it could be that everybody is tasked. And this is the one that if, if the, remember, if the hunting pressure is really small, then uh, this one is a larger value, and this means that the tasked ones will go extinct. Sorry, taskless ones will go extinct. And that's when you get just one and zero here. So in those cases where the hunting pressure is large enough, which is the case when this one is here, then we have this interesting coexistence of the different types, and we can ask how many do we have them. So then we apply this eigenvector, or we stare at that one here. So for every one taskless female, once the situation has stabilized, um, so here we have the one taskless female, and we have this many tasked ones. Um, and if I put the minus, I manipulate the minus a bit so it looks a bit more positive. I mean, it is actually positive with this assumption. You predict F divided by 2HS minus F task ones at equilibrium. But this, of course, only applies if H is high enough to make this one positive, which is the same thing as here. Um, and in that case, you know, this really is fine. Nothing is negative here. So this is like the, the ratios indicated as for every this type, how many of the other type we have, but we can also transform that to be proportions. So the proportion of the task ones is this one divided by the sum of both, and that simplifies very nicely, F divided by 2HS. And that's actually quite satisfying because I then went to um, what I had the survival values in there. Remember that we had, do I actually have it on this next slide or? Yeah, I actually did put it in here. So I don't have to go to MATLAB to show it to you. Like this is the first example that I showed to you, except that you never told me to use 0.3, but you know, this is what happens if I use 0.3. Um, so if the survival, this is now the, just the females, is 0.95, H is 0.3 and F is 1 over 7 because uh, that's the 1 divided by 3.5 and then divided again by 2. That's how I defined the uh, F. Um, it leads to a curve that is very close to 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Um, so in other words, Remember that what we were actually doing was just to compute the proportion among females. Um, so this is um, 0.6 and 0.2. Uh, that means that there's 25% tasked ones. And this actually predicts that number. Matches very nicely. And the only discrepancy here is that um, in the MATLAB code, I also had the males and they, they had a slightly different proportion being in there because um, I assumed a slightly different survival for them. Um, so. You can see that, well, this is not a mathematical proof that it's kind of like always going to be the corresponding right answer, uh, but just when I tried it once, it seemed to produce the answer that I wanted, so I was quite happy. And, and it actually should produce the same answer because it is effectively the same model. It's just whether you put the males explicitly in there or more implicitly like I did in the matrix version. So, um, we have 10 minutes time. I'm, I'm going towards this sort of interesting problem of why are there actually so many males being produced in populations in general through evolution. Um, I'm going to get started on that one, but I don't go very far. We will continue tomorrow. But just in the, in the elephant case, thinking about it one more time, um, the population does adapt. But in this case, in this really funny, costly way that you know, so many males are actually dying, um, male offspring um, are a huge waste of you know, getting a male embryo is a waste of energy because uh, very often they, they do die. But then um, this is where I started also being a bit critical about my model, not only because of the juvenile growth period, not, I, I just chose to ignore it because it was nice to ignore it, um, but also the fact that I was assuming that 
if you are producing, a, if you're getting fertilized in a way that you get a male embryo inside you and the male embryo dies, do you really have to wait 3.5 years again to, to try again? And I think that's probably an unrealistic assumption of this model. And I'm, I'm just mentioning this because that thought occurred to me quite late in this um, process and then I felt like, oh well, interesting model anyway, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to show it to you. But whenever you are modeling biological systems, there's always these, you know, every model has limitations and, and unrealistic assumptions. And sometimes they're fine and sometimes they're kind of like, oh, if I actually wanted to publish this, I think I should think about, maybe I would, I would model it in a way that this 3.5, which I've kept identical for each of the females, um, I would actually make it dependent on, you know, if you did get this failure, you would actually be able to become receptive much quicker again because you don't have to do the lactation and everything. Um, and and this, is, this is how biologists, when they're theoreticians work, they kind of like, you know, always refine the models and, and think about, you know, um, does that actually mean that the spread of this mutant allele is, is actually going much better than uh, it would without taking that into account because you don't, you're not penalized quite as badly time-wise. So, you might again go to different styles of modeling then um, because for example a model that only tracks the population once a year it might actually not be entirely appropriate when sometimes you can just shorten the period to the next reproductive attempt uh, which is why I'm actually quite keen also to show you uh, it's a different problem but I'm going to show you some continuous time modeling um, which is about, not about elephants directly anymore, but, um, but it's kind of like, um, follows quite nicely from what I've been telling you so far. Um, because the idea here is, like I'm, I keep telling you that population growth rate is not necessarily maximized by what happens evolutionarily. But at the same time, population growth rate is certainly impacted by what happens evolutionarily. Um, sometimes it's better and sometimes it's lower and sometimes you get to different kinds of carrying capacities depending on what the organisms have evolved to do. And this male-female dynamics can actually have very interesting consequences in there. Like in the elephant case, um, what I have been assuming here, um, and I think it's a realistic assumption this time, is that they don't end up with a problem of having so few males in the population that they could not get fertilized. Um, because if half of the males die, okay, you, you have fewer males than 50-50 sex ratio in the population, but elephant bulls are quite good at doing what they need to do. So this is probably fine. Um, but of course, it's a real question of, you know, how few males can you have so that it's no longer fine? And at what point should you start taking that into account? So, so the next model that I don't think we managed to solve completely, but we, again, we just continue tomorrow. This is something that I actually made um, together with Rob Brooks um, in a paper that has the funny title, Sexy to Die For? Question mark. Um, because we, it's, it's a paper that has a lot of mini models, but also sort of summaries of the literature of the idea whether sexual selection can get so strong and so crazy that you actually elevate population risk of extinction. And we go through different kinds of, actually I could, I could probably upload papers that I'm mentioning here also to the Google Drive. I, I think you would probably like that. I'll, I'll do that. Um, so this is, this is one of the models in that paper. And um, I wanted to make the point generally that, um, this sort of feels like some sort of anti-male preaching that I'm doing here, uh, that sometimes if males are very vulnerable and they die, uh, this could actually be great news from the population perspective. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, of course, for the mothers who produce these dying males. Um, so, so the, again, the individual fitness perspective can be different from the, from the population perspective. But, but population managers, if you, for example, deal with a deer or whatever, elephants or something that you want to hunt, uh, they, they actually need to think about these, uh, these things a lot. So um, the point that I'm making is that um, if you live on a finite resource, um, there's going to be some sort of carrying capacity. And um, there's going to be always some individuals born and um, whether or not this is a managed population, um, you will have 
I mean, if it is a managed population, you might be interested in getting many females living there because then they produce things that you can hunt. Um, and the if the carrying capacity is quite high, then the whole thing can be sustainably harvested. Uh, but even if you're not interested in eating what's growing there, um, it's interesting to think about it in its own right. So, like I told you yesterday, uh, males often, in mammals, they are larger than females. In many other taxa, this is actually not the case, but in, uh, in uh, mammals, it's often so. And that can also make them more vulnerable. And if you think about this, if the males are larger, they eat more food, so that's kind of bad for the females. But if they're also more vulnerable, you might get a female-biased sex ratio. And I'm so proud of my animation that I, I'm going to show, show it again. <laughs> so th because this, this shows um, two things here, um, I, and I'm going to have two parameters in the model. One is that each male, if it's alive, it's actually eating more food than each female. But you also have immortality here, so you have this missing male. Um, and the question is that, you know, this is kind of like an unbiased situation and this is the biased situation. Um, are these females actually happier here because, you know, per capita, it might be that there's more food here. On the other hand, this guy is actually eating a lot, so let's see how these factors interact. Um, and I'm just going to introduce the model, I think the analysis we go through tomorrow. So, and this is also nice because I, like I said with the elephants, that maybe the next step would be actually to move to something like a continuous time model instead of having discrete years. You could have asynchronous reproduction or synchronous reproduction. You could have kind of things happening every instantaneous time step, in which case you move to the world of differential equations, which I hope people sort of roughly are comfortable with them. Yeah, good. So this is how I did this model. Um, so I'm assuming that there's a finite, there's some sort of a growth rate of the grass. It grows um, and it's eaten by the deer. And female deer give birth to male and female deer. And um, deer of both sexes die. And the less grass there is per capita um, or as a whole, uh, the higher the mortality. Uh, but for any given grass availability, males die at a higher rate. And males can also eat more grass than uh, females per capita, which I didn't mention here, but I should have. So this is all the assumptions in here. So it's not an evolutionary model. Um, this is just you know population growth and uh, carrying capacity and things like that. So um, the grass is growing. So uh, so grass capital. This is the total amount of grass in the uh, on the island at, at the moment. Um, and it has a rate of coming back. Um, this is not a very exciting population dynamics for the grass. I'm just assuming that, you know, even from whatever low density it has become, you know, it's just kind of like com completely constant rate of growing back. And it's eaten by males and it's eaten by females. So M, big M here now is the total number of males alive at this moment. Um, F similarly. And um, C is per capita consumption, and it's different for males and females. But I'm also, oh my god, uh, I forgot to, <laughs> I, fo I forgot to change the fonts. Uh, this is going to look ugly, but luckily I'm running out of time. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, so I, so I can <laughs> I, I can change the fonts for next time. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll still go. No, it's actually, my clock is, says that it's, it's quarter two. That clock says that I still have two minutes. Uh, what is the time? Is it coffee break? Yeah, it's done. Okay, uh, yeah. I'll <laughs> okay, we'll... <laughs> yeah, let's have coffee. But do you have a question? No, I just have a message. I don't know if any of you have a question. No. I just want to let you know that the coffee break will be in, at the first floor today in the okay. big room. Okay.